one. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Dr. Judy here at the Psychological Healing Center, and I hope the volume is working today. I'm going to try to talk really loud so everyone can hear me, and again, you can ask me questions, make comments, and I'm doing some more of my map painting here, and this particular panel is panel four, chaos. And I have the good sense to paint in the background so I can concentrate more on the details and talk about the metaphor of what chaos is all about. So if you have a copy of the book, then you may have already read about panels one, two, and three, wounds of childhood, how we react to them, and how we encode them. And then there's a little section in there called the precipice. So the precipice is that place where we either retreat back to the old or we let the old fall apart, dismantle the old system, and build something new. So the chaos is actually two things. Number one, chaos can be as a result of a system gone wrong, something that was built poorly, unsustainably, and now doesn't hold up over time. So kinds of things that don't hold up over time are negative core beliefs that were ingrained into the fiber of our being by our blueprint, by our parents, by the messengers, if you will. Now we carry those messengers within us and basically what I'm gonna paint today are the foundationals of the fiber of our being. So I'm gonna paint in here what happens with chaos when the bonds start falling apart. So this represents, let's say, the mother bond, the mother DNA strand. And let's say that her injuries of childhood made her unsustainable. Okay, so there's the mother bond. And you can see that it's falling apart and not very, very sustainable at all. So let me just kind of outline that and give it a little bit more color so that you can see what is going on, what the Freud is going on here. And then we have what I'm going to represent as the male energy or the father figure. And let's paint that more of a green. And you can see greenish, we're going to do greenish bluish here. And that particular bond, if it's not solid, if dad, father figure, didn't have the solid sense of self, the solid core, then he too is falling apart and to chaos. So these two people, these two metaphorical people, if you will, do not have the ability to keep together, that means that the family structure is going to be compromised, and then the, the male energy here is also going to be compromised, and then we're going to see that this is a metaphor for father figure, and let me just give it a little bit more of the blue, the green, and you can see how it trails off into chaos, and you can see but the background is still all confused, coming from the toxicity of the past. We understand that when old bonds fall apart, they're going to create a lot of fallout material. So this is the toxicity of the past. So these two metaphorical people might represent family structure that is now falling apart. The divorce, domestic violence, the breaking down, they're not doing very well at all, and look what's happening. And I want to make sure that you know that you can ask questions. So look what happens to the bonds. The bonds are, these are the old bonds that were somehow glued together. Now they're just kind of, the bonds that were holding them together are now just falling apart, and they are in disarray. These bonds are not holding any bonds together. So the colors represent the different kinds of bonds that hold families together. And you can see that they are not holding together. 
together and longer. So let's take a look. What happens to the children? See, these bonds are flying apart. They were supposed to hold the family together, as in panel number three. The reason they're falling apart is because panel three wasn't built on an integrity. It wasn't built on a solid foundation. So now everything is in this array. Okay, and the bonds are not structured any longer. Now, let me go to my little brush here. We can see what happens when families fall apart, when families are not healthy and they don't hold you together in a, in a unit, in a family unit. What happens to the people who were in the family? Well, you can see that they start falling apart. So here, here are the people, and they are absolutely falling apart into chaos. So let's show some of these people. They're just in total disarray, and they have nothing to hold on to, and they're just flailing out there in time and space. They're not very happy at all, confused, upside down, if you will. Okay. So here are the people upside down, confused, in chaos, and they don't have any place, anybody to hold on to, any so-called sustainability. So you can see that they are not in good shape. They have nothing to hold on to. And I'll just put a few more of these people in here so that you can see how family members are not really doing well at all. So here's somebody just kind of flying off into, into space and time and very disjointed and not, not doing very well at all in terms of in terms of hanging on, in terms of security. There is no security here, so you can kind of get the feeling everything is disjointed. Please feel free to ask me questions as I ping along and metaphorically outline to you a little bit more about what happens to people when they don't have a structure to hold on to and they don't have the solidity of family uh, structure. So let's just do another little person here and this person here is is also flying off the handle, so to speak, and uh, person, these people are not very solid. And when you don't have a solid family structure, these DNA strands also represent our inner core. So that solid sense of self that we need to self-soothe, the solid sense of self that we need to have families of our own to be um, guides to be support systems and systems to them. As a result of the family chaos, we too do not have that solid inner core. And I just want to remind everyone that in order to have that solid inner core, we need to have the basic human ingredients that lead to good mental health, such as eye contact and skin contact and family structures gone right as opposed to structures gone wrong. Uh, you can't have a bunch of toxic environmental um, uh, um, material in our background. And by that I might I might refer to toxicity such as name calling or alcoholism in the family or some form of uh, abuse and neglect. You see, these things are not able to sustain us mentally and emotionally. I think we have a question. We have two questions. Okay, what are the questions? One is, is the ability to feel love based on the internal feeling I get from my neurotransmitter oxytocin and not my partner? That's a great question and I think a little bit of both because we are wired to connect so that when we're feeling connected to people, there's a flow of energy. So you see these two strands are not connecting. So think, think of dendrites, think, so think of neurons. And when these neurons are disconnected, when you're with a partner who ignores you or abuses you in some other 
form, then the flow is not being transmitted. So to answer your question, having a loving partner who has your back, having a loving partner who's a stable force, who won't, uh, won't instigate your being thrown into chaos, okay? That kind of partner is the kind of partner that we all want to have in our lives. Now, if we have a partner that is um, not offering us the stability, then it can recapitulate the old wounds of childhood, which I call the WTF, because that's what people do, is when they don't have a solid foundation, when they don't have parents who give them the emotional goodies, then they tend to pick partners who don't give them the emotional goodies. Now back to the oxytocin and self-generated oxytocin, I think you can do that also through exercise, let's say through meditation, through um, self-care, through connecting to your spirituality, through connecting with animals, through connecting with your spirituality, through connecting to anything that brings you to a higher level and makes you feel more whole and complete and intact. So these bonds, as you can see, these unsustainable bonds is a result of all the panel one means of childhood. And when we believe such lies as in panel three, lies such as you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not capable enough, then that inner core, which is based on a lie, won't build you up over time. And that's why we fall apart into um, this, this chaos. So something else that I wanted to talk about are, what are these bonds? Well, these bonds that bond us to our mental health, let's go over them again. I'm referring to Dr. John Goldie, father of attachment theory, and he talks about the importance of having uh, bonds in place that will very much be our emotional well-being. So let's let this represent, for example, uh, the bond of eye contact between mother and child. Maybe this will represent. Here, let me we have another question. Vibrant, huh? We have another question. Okay, go ahead. Um, does chaos happen due to lack of self-differentiation and um, do families enmesh and go along with the parents' dysfunction? Okay, does chaos happen as a result of lack of self-differentiation? I would say lack of self-differentiation is the end product of parenting gone wrong because when we have healthy dependency, then we can form that healthy parent-child bond, and so when we don't have that healthy core family structure, then we don't separate and individuate correctly. So we might become too clingy, and I want to try to see if I can represent that. So maybe this little child will try to grab on to cut a bond that's already in trouble, okay? So we're trying to make this a grab-on bond. Okay, so here's the clingy person, but the clingy person is really clinging to nothingness, to dysfunction. So what's going to happen? Everything's going to pull down. Everything's going to fall apart. Any other questions? No, not right now. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is a result of a system on wrong and everyone's in chaos because the main family structure was not set up in a healthy manner and this is multi-generational in nature so your mom and your dad your dad your mom are in dysfunction and they are in chaos because their core was not healthy and this is because chances are the grandparents core sense of self was unhealthy as well so as a result of everyone's mental unhealth, people do not have the ability to have mental, mental stability and sanity, and then everybody is just um, unstructured 
and uh, then falling deeper and deeper into the whole of the soul, which represents the chaos of the background. And then in order to uh, restructure this, um, we have to go back to the cause and we have to understand what happened, why this happened, and then we have to start reprocessing the feelings and start closing the emotional files. I think that question, yes. Um, why can't families talk to each other in this situation? Because I think a lot of families might fear talking. Hopefully some families are, are, are evolved enough to talk to each other. And for those of you who don't know, I have um, a beautiful way to talk to each other called the Peaceful Healing Dialogue. And you can get it off of my website under the form section. A lot of families don't talk to each other because they don't know how to talk to each other. And a lot of families talk to each other and they make even more chaos because they're talking, as they think they're talking is actually devaluing, destroying, criticizing, shaming, finger pointing. So there's no way that that kind of conversation can bring together. As a matter of fact, let me just paint in a little more of it's pulling apart. There's no even facing each other. This whole system is really, really badly pulling apart. We okay, have another question that? here. Yeah. Can you address social engagement in a person with long-term isolation? Social engagement with a person with long-term isolation? First of all, isolation could be a defense mechanism have to understand what the person is defending against. And we're going to be delving into defense mechanism next time, panel number five. And do get a copy of my book, whether it's a free one off the PDF or a hard copy, which you can get off of Amazon. And by the way, if you like the book and read the book, then I always appreciate uh, reviews on Amazon. I always appreciate likes on um, on Facebook and um, reviews of, of, of people who they have interfaced with at the Psychological Healing Center. They have a beautiful group of people who break down the chaos for you, now that we're talking about chaos, so that instead of being at the effect of life, you can then move out of this territory and become more causal. Another way that I like to look at chaos is bringing down an old system. When you have a system that does not work, when toxic ties don't further the, uh, the, the psycho, psychological and spiritual development of the human being or the human race, then we have to bring the old systems down. So remember communism at some point Communism and the Wall of China came down. Why? Because it wasn't a sustainable system. People created revolutions to break down old systems. And so we also can proactively take down old systems so that you don't have to keep hanging on to something that doesn't work any longer. So it's really important, if you can, to become proactive involved in tearing down your old system rather than reactively falling into chaos. And I think we have another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have two more. Okay. Um, is Thanks this, for jumping on yeah, it. Um, yeah. <laughs> is this triangulation rather than genuine communication? I'm not sure what you mean in this particular example. Triangulation might be when you pull a third party in to try to falsely bolster something that's falling apart. And so when you have true communication, it's me to you. It's not sideways, unless it's a therapeutic sideways. Dr. Murray Bowen would triangulate himself into the therapeutic configuration in order to help people detangle from the past in order to move the system along. So unless you're a therapeutically triangulated in person, then chances are that the, the third party is just another way to, uh, to, to buffer the direct communication and maybe even um, have
have that third party be a scapegoat or a third party be uh, a, a person that they're using as a defense mechanism to avoid the intimacy, to avoid the conversation. I got another one. Okay. Um, if the ability to feel love is based on oxytocin and not the other person, does it matter what my partner does? Meaning, if my neurotransmitter doesn't work properly, does it matter? Okay, if we're in a true state of depletion, if we have completely depleted all of our uh, neurotransmitters, then in, in a sense, that's, I think, where this question becomes relevant because sometimes no matter what other people do, it's not being registered because the, the capacity to take in love, the capacity to take in kindness may have been somehow distorted or thwarted or destroyed, in which case we have to take a look at the old defense mechanisms erected around perhaps guarding your heart so that you would, would not have to go through any uh, more pain and suffering. So I think these questions are really excellent, questions about oxytocin and, and so on, and I think that if you can look at it in a sort of a simple model that when we are imploding or when we are exploding and we are not therapeutically unloading and we're stuck in bad cycles, things will fall apart on us and we're not going to be furthering the program. We're just going to be falling into a big psychological uh, void, if you will, and going down the psychological uh, tubes, if you will. So in order to um, in order to be the cause, we've got to go back to the beginning point and understand what happened. You know, why, why are we in this state? Why are we in pain and suffering? Uh, what, what was the cause behind that? And then really start reprocessing the feelings so that we're not living a life of chaos, we're not burying ourselves into defense mechanisms, and ultimately um, we're connecting to people who are more um, kind, loving, um, interested in our, 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 our well-being, and that we learn how to treat ourselves with this level of kindness so that we're not activating and triggering ourselves into chaos. And, one other thing about chaos is that when we get emotionally triggered by uh, situations, other people, that's when the panel three negative core beliefs get triggered, and when they get triggered, this is what it looks like. Triggers like, for example, if your boss says you're, you know, you're, you're incompetent, then you may fall into emotional uh, chaos because you may have been brought up to think that you are incompetent. Do we have another question? Yeah, we okay. have we have two new ones. Okay, so, so awesome. First right. one is um, smear campaigns create chaos. So why do parents do this? Say that again. Smear campaigns create chaos. Why do parents do this? Smear campaigns create chaos. Why do parents do this? I think parents do this because of their own dysfunction, and if they're trying to smear other people, especially their children with their problems, that's called projection. And why are they projecting? Because they're in massive psychological distress themselves. They don't know what to do with the pain. They don't want to process the pain. They don't even want to open up that can of worms. So sometimes the children are the targets of the pain. And that's why parents who do this are unhealed parents. And as I say in one of my videos, uh, parents, please own your own stuff. If you're a parent, own your own stuff, and the more you can do that, the more you can help your next uh, generation heal. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Does the pain of abuse and humiliation ever completely go away? I think that is a great question. We are all humans. We're very, very sensitive. Does it ever completely go away? I don't see how it could 100% completely go away. Just like we have scars, I think it will leave a scar. Maybe we can use the scar as a reminder of the past and as a, a reference point of 
how we fought, how far we can go within ourselves to heal, and the way to to really complete it so that it doesn't rear its ugly head is to go back to point A, panel one, the causal point, and understand and reprocess the pain, the anger, and the humiliation. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Um, we'll just wait until they pass by here. Well, life falls into chaos. <laughs> yeah. And remember what chaos is. Chaos is like en entropy. There's always organization and disorganization. So I wanted my math process to go perfectly. Now the dogs are barking in the background. Now it's going to be chaos. <laughs> um, we have one last question. Okay. Um, if a person is completely depleted of oxytocin, will it be hard for them to hear or see loving actions when they're dating? Like, meaning no matter what one says, the depleted person can't feel it. I think that there's validity to what you're saying. The question is, can a person who's really depleted of oxytocin really feel the positive uh, love of a person in dating situation if somebody is then being uh, in, in the presence of somebody more kind and loving, they may miss out on that because number one, unless we are mentally healthy, we will tend to pick people who actually do injure us. And the other thing is that we may not know how to take in the love because in order to take in the love, we have to feel that first of all, love exists. And second of all, that taking in anything from another person is, is, is the same thing to do as opposed to a toxic, crazy-making uh, uh, idea. All right. I think that's all the questions. So with that said, if there are any other questions, please ask away. I'm Dr. Judy Rosenberg, a licensed clinical psychologist here at the Psychological Healing Center. And I created a mind map to heal human disconnect so that people don't have to suffer and fall into chaos and be at the effect of life. And this process is a from through to process from the wounds of the past dismantling, see this is the dismantling the old system and then paradigm shifting us into a better way of being and a better way of seeing. And are there any other questions that are being asked or um, comments? Yes. Okay. Um, do the flashbacks of the chaos go away completely, which could also bring about bodily reactions such as nervousness and anxiety? Okay, so the flashbacks of chaos, I, I think we'll use chaos then as a, a flashback of a metaphor of co either complex PTSD, which is old PTSD that was never resolved, or, or any kind of PTSD where the, um, the, the psychological files are still open. So will it, will it ever, what was the question, will it ever go away? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could go away when you get your head straightened out about whether this, this, um, these triggers are really threatening and they're real or whether they are in past old files and they're not necessarily threatening in the here and now. So how they go away is we have to make a distinction between what's really happening or what was happening and why are why, why are events in the here and now still triggering all old traumatic events? Any other questions anybody has? And don't forget everyone, I am going live tonight on uh, YouTube and we are going to be talking about contact versus no contact for siblings and family members, so please tune in tonight, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'm gonna be discussing the subject, or if you do um, ask more questions. I just wanted you to all understand how this mind map is really a metaphor for all kinds of things. In this case, you see, no bonding, crazy chaos. The bonds are 
totally flying into outer space and they're not holding the structure. I have two more. Okay. <laughs> um, does a patient experience flashbacks when doing mind map therapy? Yeah, sometimes. And, and that's not a bad thing to pull up old files so that they can be completed in the right way. Because a flashback is your mind's attempt to straighten everything out. Just remember, it's the WTF, the left of foot. Let's bring it back around again so that this time around you can complete it and straighten it out and have peace around it. And then, um, he, this guy dated a woman um, and she was not able to take it in. She became hurtful and verbally abusive. Was she perhaps trying to recreate a form of abuse based on old abuse? I, I would think so. So the question is, a guy was dating a woman and she wasn't able to take in any of the good, correct? And she would, she would rebel against it. I think that this particular woman, it sounds to me, that uh, she doesn't have any trust in the world. So maybe her past panel one wounds were wounds of betrayal, where somebody might have pulled her into the loving system and then flipped it on her and betrayed her. So now she thinks that any signs of love or affection or kindness may just be a trap. So that would be, she would have to straighten out her world and be shuffle, so to speak, her perceptions around that and go back to the cause of the problem so that she can be clear that the man that she's dating is the trigger. However, the cause of the problem is her original blueprint family of origin. Okay. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Unless we have a last minute the metaphors and how these metaphors are not only metaphors, they actually come to life in our living world, in our systems, and our systems gone wrong, and hopefully flip that around into a better structure that does not fall apart. Thank you.